Somebody said to me just a few minutes ago, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say tonight. I said, so am I. Uh, but I've been asked to speak on neither oldest nor best. And, and well, you've heard the, the, the book. Uh, Brother Brown has been so gracious to promote the book. And, uh, but just a review, I think m most of you here tonight are, are up to speed on the basics. I know there's some uh, teenagers and some church people here tonight. But all of the modern language Bibles have one thing in common, or let me rephrase that, virtually all of the modern Bible uh, translations have one thing in common, and that is they're translated from a different text than the King James Bible. And there are scores and scores, somebody said a thousand different English translations. Uh, almost all of them are based on what's called the modern critical text, which is roughly 150 years old. Now, we, we won't take the time tonight to enumerate the, the, the specific differences between the critical text and the traditional text, otherwise sometimes known as the received text, the textus receptives, uh, the Byzantine text, and there's a number of synonyms. But the critical text has eliminated or partially eliminated about 192 verses in the New Testament. It has deleted or omitted about almost 8,000 words. And it's not an insignificant issue, folks. And when you know what to look for, there's very clear distinctives between the, the, the critical text and the, uh, the traditional text of the, of, of the Bible. Now, the modern critical text is based primarily on two manuscripts. When Westcott and Hort produced their text back in 1881, it was based ex exclusively on two, but today it's largely two. 90% of the modern critical text is based upon a, a document called Codex Vaticanus, which is Latin basically meaning the Book of the Vatican, because it's found in the, the Vatican Library. We'll get to that here a little later on tonight. 8% of the, the critical text is based on another manuscript called Codex Sinaiticus. And then there is about 2% from a, a scattered group of other manuscripts. Uh, and, and another name for the critical text is the eclectic text because it's based on a variety of manuscripts. But principally, 98% is based on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And that is what I want to talk to tonight. Uh, talk about tonight. As you know, the, the mantra of all the modern Bible translations for the last uh, 100 and I'll say 40 years roughly, give or take, the mantra has been that these new modern Bibles are based on the oldest and best manuscripts. The conventional wisdom, the conventional history has been that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were prepared in the first part of the 4th century, somewhere between 331 up to maybe as late as 350, maybe even 325 A.D. And the, 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 the basic theory of, of the critical text uh, is that because these two are allegedly, and I'm, I'm supplying the word allegedly, but because these two manuscripts are the oldest, that therefore they are closest to the originals, and we therefore must weight them as more important than the the the, the ninety nine other ninety nine percent other manuscripts which are which 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 support the, uh, the the traditional text, and so the whole theory of modern Bibles is that they are based on the oldest and best manuscripts. We've all heard that. I have a Schofield Bible here in my hand, and and uh, Doctor Schofield. Uh, had that position. And of course, you go back uh, 50 years ago and almost all fundamentalists had that position because it was the conventional wisdom. We don't have time to go into all that tonight. But <clears throat> uh, from Schofield to the present, the mantra has been oldest and best. Dean Bergon, 150 years ago roughly, demonstrated that those manuscripts are not the best. 
And those of us who have been studying this subject now for the last several decades, we all know that they are not good manuscripts. They are full of problems internally, not only in doctrinal issues and diminishing particularly the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they, they are corrupt manuscripts from all the uh, crossovers and, and overwriting and, and uh, 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 corrections that are made on them. They just are not reliable. But in the last several years, and, and by the way, the, I am not the first guy to come up with this. In the last several years, and I, I'm one of the first to do a book on it, though there's another brother in England who's, who produced a book before I did, but uh, in, in the last several years, there have been a number of folks who have come to the conclusion that the, the, the modern critical text is neither old. It was not produced in 325 or 331 or, or, or whatever in the, the, the fourth century, but rather they are, of, in particularly the case of Sinaiticus, very recent origin, and thereby and therefore are fraudulent to what they are purported to be. Now, so let, let me tell you the story tonight. Some of you have read the book and you're aware of it. Back in 1838... There was a man in Greece uh, by the name, a young man, by the way, a, a man in Greece by the name of Constantine Simonides. Uh, Constantine Simonides uh, was reared uh, uh, on and about Mount Athos, Mount Athos, which is near Thessalonica. Americans call it Thessalonica, but the Greeks call it Thessalonica. Um, uh, Mount Athos on Mount, uh, 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 or rather on uh, uh, near uh, Salonica, Thessalonica, was where the majority of the Greek scriptoriums have been for the last thousand years. Scriptoriums is where the, 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 the scriptures were copied prior to the advent of, of printing. And Erasmus, of course, his major contribution was that he put the, the received text into print. He did not create it, he just put it into print. And it went from there. Prior there, too, it was all hand-copied. Well, anyway, Simonides grew up there. He was a Greek. He knew Greek. He knew classical Greek. He knew Koine Greek. He knew uh, modern Greek. He was a Greek. Moreover, he was a paleographer. That is, he was expert in textual analysis of the letter forms and uh, in, in reproducing uh, the text. And so in the year 1838... Uh, the leadership there at the monastery on Mount Athos to which he belonged uh, asked him, requested him, to produce a, a complete copy of the Bible, and this included the Old Testament, to complete a, a, a copy of the Bible in the old Koine Greek, it, which was called uncial uh, uh, characters, uncial writing. Today we'd call that all uppercase or capital letters. And uh, in, in that era is when, uh, and, and that's why the, uh, Tischendorf would later date it that old, because that was when uncial writing was the vogue, was, was the, the primary way of writing the Greek language. And so in 1838, the latter part of the year, uh, Simonides sat down at the project uh, to, to copy the Bible uh, in, into a fresh manuscript in uncial characters. Now his motive was this. Uh, the uh, monastery that, to which he was a part of there on Mount Athos, and there were a number of them, but the monastery of which he was a part was seeking to present uh, this new copied Bible to the Tsar of Russia in St. Petersburg, Russia. And the motive was they, they, the, the Tsar of Russia, the, the Greek church and the Russian church, the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox, uh, uh, were, were often colleagues and, 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 and collaborated together and were relatively close in their, their doctrine and so forth. And the purpose was to uh, present it to the Tsar so that they hoped he would donate funds for that, the, their monastery to, to buy a printing press. And so Samaritan set out. Uh, it took him a little over a year, uh, around 18 months, uh, to produce this copy of the Old Testament in uncial uh, characters, uh, uh, uppercase letters. But he did it in haste. 
He completed it in 1840. He did it in haste, and he made quite a few mistakes. And therefore, his uncle Benedict, who was the, uh, I forget the title, but he was the head man of the, the, the monastery there, uh, went back and made many corrections. And you look at a copy of Sinaiticus today, it's full of corrections. And there were others there on the, the, the monastery staff, another scribe and calligrapher, uh, who likewise made numerous corrections. And because of the numerous corrections which were made, they therefore consider the project to be a failure, that is, insofar as giving it to the, the Tsar of Russia as a gift. It therefore made its way to a place called St. Catherine's Monastery, which was a Greek Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox monastery. It made its way to St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai in Egypt. And there went into the library. Well, you all know the story how that in 1844, uh, Constantine von Tischendorf, a German rationalist, and let me just hit the pause button and, and get off on a sidebar here. Tischendorf was a, a German rationalist. He was a liberal Lutheran. And he, he was a young man also, 28 years old when he began this quest. But Tischendorf took the view and the position that the true New Testament had been lost to antiquity. He completely rejected the received text. And because it had been lost to antiquity, therefore he took it upon him as his life mission to, by finding ancient manuscripts in the Middle East, to reconstruct the New Testament. Well, folks, I have an announcement to make. The New Testament has not been lost. God has preserved his word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But he was a liberal, and so he set out to reconstruct the New Testament by searching several monastery libraries, uh, places of, of, of uh, ancient documents in the Mediterranean world. And so in 1844, he went to St. Catherine's Monastery. We have all heard the story how that in going to the library that he noticed an old document in a wastebasket ready to be burned. You've all heard that. We've all been taught that. That is the conventional wisdom. Well, in all likelihood, that never happened. And in all likelihood, Tischendorf stole a portion of that ancient manuscript from the library and made up that story to cover his tracks. And the, the, the authorities at the Greek monastery to this day say that it was never such as Tischendorf said, found in a wastebasket ready to be burned. Why in the world would people in the library burn an ancient manuscript? The logic doesn't, doesn't wash. Well, he took, uh, the, the, he took 43 leaves, that is pages, that would be 86 pages, 43 leaves, and uh, took them uh, back to the University of Leipzig in Germany, which was his alma, uh, alma mater, and placed it in the library there. He called it Codex uh, uh, Augustanus Frederico. Very prestigious, highfalutin name. It, it simply meant the book that was dedicated to his, his patron, uh, uh, Augustus, uh, or Frederick Augustus, I should say, who was the, the, the prince of Saxony, Germany. And so uh, a portion of it went to the, the library at the University of Leipzig. In 1852, now eight years later, Simonides happened to visit the library there at St. Catherine's. And he noticed his manuscript that he had produced. And he was puzzled as to why it now looked older than it did when it was just several years earlier. Couldn't quite understand that. It looked like it had been washed with lemon juice and herbs to make it look older. They, they, and they attempted to make it look older. It didn't work very well, as we'll see here in a few minutes. But he took note of that. And this was all in, in, in later uh, correspondence and, and historical records. Well, meanwhile, in 1859, time is marching on, 
Tischendorf returns to the, the, uh, the monastery there at St. Catherine's and wanted to get the rest of the manuscript. The, the, the monk said no. And um, he, he went to their superiors and they said no. Finally, he said, look, I will, will you agree to loan it to me? I will borrow it from you and then return it to you. And they agreed to that in writing. But history has shown he had no intention of returning it. Once again, he basically stole it, the remainder of the, of the, of the manuscript. And that was sent to St. Petersburg, Russia, and presented to the Tsar of Russia, uh, who gave uh, uh, Tischendorf, there's two Constantines here, it's easy to get them, get them mixed up, but gave it to, uh, the Tsar of Russia then gave Tischendorf the rights to publish it. And so he collated the portion there at Leipzig with the portion at St. Petersburg uh, and, and pre produced a facsimile document. Now, when I say facsimile, it's not modern high digital reproduction, folks. It was rather crude uh, 19th century printing. But it was basically the text of Sinaiticus. Um, and he took that, this, uh, th this collated facsimile and it quickly wound up in the hands of the, the renowned Westcott and Hort in London, who were already working on their, what would become known as the Westcott and Hort text. Well, meanwhile, in 1860, another year later, Simonides visited England, and he was a man to this point who was highly regarded all across uh, 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 Europe, I should say, as an expert on ancient documents. He was considered uh, a, a man virtually without peer in his knowledge and his erudition on Greek texts, particularly uh, from the ancient world. Uh, that was soon to change very quickly. But in 1860, Simonides in England saw that facsimile copy of his, uh, uh, the, the, what came to be known as Sinaiticus. And he said, wait a minute, hold the phone. That's in the Greek, by the way. He said, I created that back in 1940, 20 years ago. That's not an old document. That's not 1,500 years old. I did that. Well, that made its way to, among other people, uh, Dr. Hort, who went public in, in the, 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 the newspapers of England, I think it was The Guardian, which is still a major newspaper in England today, and basically said, this guy is a liar. And being so demeaned in his character, uh, uh, Simonides then sent a letter to, the, I believe it was The Guardian newspaper, it's in the book, I'm winging it here tonight, folks, but sent a letter to the Guardian newspaper saying, look, this is what really happened. And he presented in a fairly uh, long letter the details, largely what I shared with you tonight, that he produced this back in 1840. And that produced a flurry of letters to the editors of several uh, major uh, British newspapers. It was no secret now. This was out in the open. I mean, it was on the evening news every night, as it were, in the British press. And they debated back and forth. Uh, but Westcott and Hort, nevertheless, took the, the Sinaiticus manuscript, that, the, the facsimile, now bear in mind with you, the, the, the copied facsimile document, and incorporated that into their modern critical text that they were developing. Now what is interesting, prior to this time, Simonides was considered a great scholar, a man uh, uh, expert in Greek documents. After this point, he came to be known as Simonides the Hoaxer. And if you go online today and, 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 and do a search on Simonides, you almost instantly come up with Simonides the Hoaxer. It today is the conventional wisdom. And what is funny uh, is that uh, he, he, he dealt in manuscripts. It was his business of finding ancient manuscripts, bringing it to the courts of Europe, and selling them. And, and they, were, they were agreed, these are ancient documents. After 1860, the, the, the allegation basically was anything he ever touched was a forgery. 
Everything he ever touched was a hoax, except Sinaiticus. Isn't that interesting? Well, and so there was controversy. Now, there are three powerful evidences that Simonides was telling the truth. Number one, there is corroborating evidence. There is corroborating witness. A man by the name of Kalinikos, another Greek uh, 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 scholar, said, I saw Simonides producing this document. Eyewitness. And there were others who corroborated Kalinikos. Uh, the Tischendorf and his subordinates said, oh, he just made up this Kalinikos stuff. But there is very clear historic corroboration that Kalinikos was a real person and that he was uh, accurate in, in corroborating what Simonides had said. And again, this was very much in the British press. Uh, but not only was there corroborating uh, uh, witnesses, but there also is very powerful forensic evidence. That is physical evidence. Now, in an ancient document going back to the 4th or 5th century, by virtue of its age, will be oxidized. And we think of oxidation today often in the terms of iron, and it becomes rusty. Well, the, the documents were not iron, obviously. They were produced usually on parchment, which was an animal skin. But nevertheless, uh, they, it was the essence of paper. It was high-quality paper, not made of paper or, or wood fiber, but of animal skins. But other ancient documents, for example, Codex Biza, uh, which was uh, uh, owned by Theodore Biza of the Reformation, Codex Biza, uh, you can go online to the British Library and they have high-definition digital photographs that you can look at and they are, uh, it is clearly oxidized, that it is tan, probably almost the color of this pulpit. You can go online and look at Codex Alexandrinus, uh, another Alexandrian uh, manuscript. It too is oxidized, it's brown, it's almost bronze in its, its coloration. When, and, and you can do this online, brethren, you go online and look at Sinaiticus. It's not bronze, it's not tan. It's white or off-white. In the year 1856, a Russian scholar by the name of Dobushuts, I'm sorry, Upensky, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Upensky in 1856 went to the University of Leipzig and was requested to examine this Codex Augustanus Frederico, or Frederico Augustanus, I should say, and he said it was white parchment. And particularly the, the Leipzig portion is, is such. In uh, 1910, a German researcher by the name of Ernest von Dobschutz uh, went to Leipzig and, and saw the document and said it is snow white parchment. Well, this is laser printing paper. That's about snow white. In the year 1913, uh, a, a Scottish uh, uh, researcher went to Leipzig and saw the document, uh, a, a man by the name of J.M. McClymount, and he said it was written on snow white vellum. And if you don't believe me, now this is the last book and somebody's already spoken for it, but you can order more from us. Now we had to charge more for this book, folks, because there are pictures in it. Color pictures in it. And I know that's why some of you guys are buying it, because it's got pictures in it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. A, a picture, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. 
And people have, have, have read this book, and some, some of it goes over them. You know, it, it gets somewhat technical, though I've tried to put it in on a level where people can understand it. But when they come to the picture pages, folks, it's, it says it all. Here is a picture of Codex Biza. I don't know if you can see it clearly out there. It's rather bronze in its appearance. Here's a, a these incidentally are all uh, digital, high definition photographs, all of them by the British Library. It's all from the same source with the same equipment, the same lighting. It's all standardized to that degree. Uh, here is Alexandrinus. Again, it's, it's bronze in its color. Here is Sinaiticus. And you probably can't see it clear, but it just, it's just, it's white. Maybe not snow white anymore because they did attempt to doctor it. And that says it all. I mean, you can see it with your eyes. Uh, it's called the Sinaiticus Project. You can go online and, and look it up. And uh, the British Library, I think it was 2011, uh, about six years ago, put the, they, they combined, they sent a, a, a crew to uh, Leipzig, to make high definition digital color photographs of what is there in Leipzig. They likewise did the same in London at the, at the British Museum. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the documents that were sent to Russia, the manuscript that was sent to Russia, was sold by the Soviets to the British Museum in 1933 to help underwrite the Russian government, which was struggling, the Soviet government. And it became the property of the, the, the British Museum, and, and since it's come to be known as the British Library, at least the portion where the, the document is at, the manuscript is at. And so British librarians, uh, using the same equipment, the same lighting, uh, photographically collated these documents. And, and, and curiously, there is still just a, a, a very small amount, just a page or two left in St. Petersburg, and a small amount left at uh, Mount Sinai. And there's some significance to the stuff that's left behind. And they produced what has come to be known as the Sinaiticus Project. You can go online tonight, if you wish, and, and look at it. And uh, it, it's zoomable. You can zoom in and out, and, and you can look at details. And I would submit to you tonight that uh, men such as Westcott and Hort never saw the detail that you can see tonight. They saw facsimiles, black and white facsimiles, of rather crude 19th century letterpress printing. And you can see the, the, the anomalies and the issues, some of which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Now, it's, it's, it's curious also that portions of Vaticanus are not heavily oxidized either, particularly Mark 16. We'll get to that here in a moment. But not only are the, 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 the leaves of Sinaiticus a, a, a variation of white, an off-white, but they also are relatively supple. You say, how do you know that? Because the British Library allowed the BBC to come in uh, in, in 2011. It was right around the time of the, the anniversary, the, the 400th production of, of the King James Bible. And, and, and of course, these people are not up to speed, I think, in some areas. Uh, some uh, associated the Codex Sinaiticus with, with the King James Bible, uh, which it has nothing to do with historically and actually. But anyway, they, they made a YouTube video. You can go online tonight. The, the, the address is in the book. I don't have it here in front of me. Um, and see that, that, that BBC, knew, it was for the news, the evening news. And see the, 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 the reporter interviewing uh, one of the curators there at the library. And that curator has uh, Sinaiticus out, and he's just flipping the pages, flipping the pages, flipping the pages. This is supposed to be 1,500 years old. Folks, if that truly was 1,500 years old, they'd be treating it a lot differently. And the, the fact of the matter is the British Library openly and candidly admits that the condition of this manuscript really doesn't fit the age that it is supposed to be. Now, uh, as a sidebar, the man who dated Sinaiticus, claiming it went to the 4th century, was none other than Tischendorf. I think he knew better. In fact, I think he was behind some of the alterations, and more alterations are coming here in a second, I'll tell you about. But all this dating, the, 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 the allegation that it, it is old goes back to one man, and that is Tischendorf. Well, not only is there the, the, the color of the, uh, the, the document and the, the suppleness of the document, but 
there are wormholes in the document. And that's to be expected in an old document. Uh, truly, they're bookworms. But here is what's interesting. In some places, the text goes around the wormholes. And if it truly was an ancient document, the wormholes would go through the text. But Simonides, as he uh, was working on a relatively recent uh, uh, document of parchment, there were some wormholes in it, and he worked around them. And once again, it mitigates against the idea that it's ancient and rather supports Simonides in his account. But here is an, another interesting thing. Uh, again, you can go online and, and look at Sinaiticus from, from the, the beginning to the end. Um, and there are some very obvious mutilations on some pages. Incidentally, uh, shortly after the, uh, the, the, the BBC did their account and uh, the, 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 the celebration of the, the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, a publisher, uh, Hendricks, Hendrickson Publishers, which is a you know, quote-unquote Christian or religious publishing house uh, out, I think it's in Massachusetts, they were allowed to likewise photograph page by page by page with, with high definition digital photography, the entire uh, Sinaiticus uh, document, the entire manuscript that exists. And you can buy it today for the slight fee of about $1,000 and, and go through it line by line. Brother Brown has such a copy. He is a man of means. And uh, <laughs> uh, I had to go to a library down in the Twin Cities and, and found a copy there. And, and, and my wife and I went down there one day and spent the better part of the day going through Sinaiticus page by page by page and looking at each page. Now, in the debates that Simonides had with Tischendorf in the press, and incidentally, Simonides challenged Tischendorf for public debate. He refused to do so. And, but Simonides said, look, I put in, in, in a number of places throughout that document, throughout that manuscript, my initials and acrostic little marks that would identify me as the producer, the author, the copyist, the scribe. And he enumerated that. Well, here is the strange irony. Every one of those pages have been mutilated. And his marks have been removed. I wonder who did that. In some pages, it's clear that someone took a straight edge with a pen knife and sliced it. You can see it. I've seen it with my eyes. In one case, vertically. In another case, horizontally. And just sliced off half the page. In another section, it's obvious someone took a scissors and made a rectangular cut out of a page. And they tried to make a jagged and edge. Uh, it looked like it perhaps, it perhaps was old, but they, they got in a hurry and they didn't do it all of that. Amazing. Well, I was in contact with the British Library, and I had requested permission to come and see it, and they had me fill out all the voluminous paperwork uh, to get permission to see it. And uh, guess what they said? No. And uh, they said, this is such a valuable document, we can't allow everybody to come and see it. Well, I think the real reason is the already aware, I mean, there's already been a book published in England on this, and there's probably been more noise in England about it than here, and they didn't want someone else coming and writing another book about it. And I told them that's what I was hoping to do, do research on it to put, to put it into a book. But they said, we will answer your questions. We'll gladly and happily answer your questions. And they were fairly cooperative up to the point. And I wrote them one day and said, have you ever done any uh, uh, forensic dating of the document other than just taking Tischendorf's word? And I said, specifically, has anybody done a, a carbon-14 analysis of, uh, of, of Sinaiticus? Now, I'm well aware that carbon-14 is not an accurate way of, of determining dating. It's really a very crude and, and problematic way, but radio, radiocarbon dating, radioactive, um, uh, uh, not radioactive, but... Um, I'm trying to think of the word. But anyway, carbon-14 dating. And they never answered. Silence. Now that says to me two things. A, they never have, they've never made any attempt to, 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 to docu document it uh, with radiometric dating. That's what I was trying to say. And, or two, they did, and the evidence doesn't show it's 1,500 years old, but maybe 150 years old. 
Well, here's the third element uh, in Sinaiticus uh, of evidence corroborating uh, Simonides' claim, and that is internal evidence. A British literary expert by the name of Sir James Donaldson, he got his sir title, his, his knight title, from the King of England uh, around 1900 for his great work in British literary research. I mean, this was no lightweight. And Donaldson evaluated Sinaiticus textually, internally. And he came to the conclusion that there are words in Sinaiticus that are in modern Greek but did not exist in Koine Greek in biblical times or in the, in the fourth century. What that simply means is, let me, let me use this illustration, let's take Shakespeare. And uh, someone says, here I have an ancient copy of Shakespeare. Very, very old. And so you read it, and you find the word internet in there, or the word iPhone in there. Uh, and you know, wait a minute, <laughs> something's wrong with that picture. And that's essentially what Donaldson did, and he has never been gainsayed on that. No one has ever challenged him on that. And the internal evidence shows very clearly that it's of recent origin, using modern Greek as opposed to classical or Koine Greek the ancient Greek. And so there is the testimony of Simonides, there is the forensic evidence, and there is the internal textual evidence. Well, I must hasten, because I want to leave Brother Brown lots of time here tonight. What about Vaticanus? Well, the story is not as flamboyant or, or uh, dramatic as that of Sinaiticus. But here's a major issue in Sinatic or, or Vaticanus. And again, the Vatican in the year 2015, that's only... Two and a half years ago, early in 2015, likewise put a high digital, full color, uh, digital representation of, of, of Vaticanus on the internet. You can go home tonight and look at it, page by page by page. And again, see detail that very few have seen, apart from the Catholics in Tischendorf, who clearly, uh, I don't have the time to get into it tonight, but clearly was in collusion with the Catholics. But here is the thing that struck me as I went through Vaticanus, and that is every biblical book of Vaticanus begins with what, what printers call an initial drop cap. And you say, what's that? Well, it's a large letter at the beginning of a, of, 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 of a, of a book, of a, a document. Many Bibles, today my Bible has a, a drop cap at the beginning of every chapter. Now, it's not a, a fancy one, but these are fancy, full-color drop caps that are, when you look at it carefully, it's integral to the text. That is, they were produced at the same time that the text was produced, was copied. What's the problem with that? Drop caps were not invented till the Middle Ages. And I have looked at, at as many ancient documents as I could find, and they're essentially, and, and by the way, the, the, in, in Vaticanus it's full color. And the, the artwork clearly is medieval in character. I've looked at other ancient documents, and there either is no artwork, or if there is uh, in the text, text artwork, or if there is, it's just some black uh, kulakus at the end to fill up a little space at the bottom of the page. But the drop cap issue is something that was formed in the Middle Ages. Now, historically, Vaticanus was first recorded uh, in the Vatican Library in the year 1475. There is no record of it prior thereto. Moreover, the first historical record of anyone consulting Vaticanus was when Erasmus inquired of it in the year 1521. How much time do I have, Brother David? Still got another 12 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just quickly touch on the, the, the last... 12 verses of Mark. I think we all know that they're missing, or at least they, they, they are not there in, in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Did you know that the only two manuscripts in the world that are missing uh, the last 12 verses of Mark are Sinaiticus and Vaticanus? Even the other Alexandrian uh, manuscripts have them. And our time is running and it gets pretty complex here, but it's clear when you look at the documents that it, it, they purposefully were omitted. In fact, there is every degree of, of, of evidence that 
uh, the same person who did Mark 16 in Vaticanus is the same person who did Mark 16 in Sinaiticus. And they, in fact, uh, were omitted. Now, a, a book, modern-day books, this book is, uh, and most printers today do books in what are called 16-page signatures. They are, uh, and then it's all sewn together in a hardbound book, 16 pages. In ancient times, they were called, or not ancient, but uh, biblical times, even, even medieval times, they were called choirs, Q-U-I-R-E-S. And there is evidence, I don't have time tonight to get into it, that the, the choir, the Q-U-I-R-E, of Mark 16 in both Vaticanus and Sinaiticus have been inserted, missing the last 12 verses of Mark 16. The same person did that. Isn't that interesting? Now, what's the last 12 verses of Mark 16 deal with? Well, you know what it is. It's the resurrection. Rationalism, uh, higher criticism, took the position that the original gospel was Mark. And the other gospels were, were knockoffs from it, offshoots from it. And the premise is the real gospel, Mark, does not have the resurrection. Do you see the fingerprints of the evil one there, folks? Denying the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's, there's other stuff here. I just don't have time to get into it, and it's somewhat technical. But the, you say, well, who may have done all this? We know for a fact that Tischendorf clearly collaborated with, shall I use the word, colluded. And there's very definite evidence that he collaborated with the Vatican. And in 1857, uh, Catholic Cardinal Angelo Mai made the first facsimile edition of Vaticanus, by the way, without the last 12 verses of Mark. And we know, or at least the, the allegation has been made, and by some uh, Tischendorf himself, incidentally, that the same scribe who did Mark 16 in Vaticanus did it in Sinaiticus. I don't think Vaticanus is an ancient document copied from an Alexandrian document, but it's not an old document. Well, here's the conclusion. They both were modified sometime before 1857. And as we've already seen, Sinaiticus is completely fraudulent. Titian, or, or, or Sina, Sin, Simonides is not the fraudulent one. He was just producing a, a, a document for the Tsar of Russia. It's, uh, it's Tischendorf, yeah. who post-dated it and tried to make it look old. They're neither oldest nor best. And folks, these are the, 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 the basic pillars of all the modern Bible versions. The mantra is they are based on the oldest and best manuscripts. The evidence is compelling. They're not old. They are fraudulent in their providence. And therefore, the foundation of all these modern Bibles collapses. It's an amazing it's an amazing story. Father, tonight, thank you for the opportunity to share these ideas and these, these historical facts with the, 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 the council tonight. And bless as we continue with the final meeting with Dr. Brown this evening, and I ask it in Jesus' name.